Friends, good evening. Good evening. Well, we are so blessed to have the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer with us in-house this time. You may recall that we have tried to have John with us uh, twice before uh, in the last six years. And one of them was uh, John couldn't be with us physically. He had to be off-site, and we, we tried uh, miserably, actually, to have him at a distance on video. Uh, and it worked the day before, but on the day, uh, we couldn't hear John. And so we had to use a, a phone, and it worked out fine. But, um, and then the following year, we had John with us in our very first ever virtual annual meeting, and we we're appreciative of John's presence there, but it's, John, it's wonderful to have you here present uh, with us in person uh, as you come to the time of ending your time as the general minister and president. We look forward to blessing you tomorrow and, and hearing from you tonight. Before we say, I say anything else about John, we have with us also the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson. Karen Georgia, would you please stand and let us recognize you? We are so blessed to have you with us. We're going to get to hear Kara Georgia share tomorrow uh, uh, preaching, but also a little bit from our local arrangements and general synod experience. So we're excited to have you with us. So glad you're here. There's so much to say about John Dorhauer, um, but I won't say too much because uh, we really want to hear from you and, and have some ice cream. So um, <laughs> it's hot and I'm wearing long sleeves. Um, I don't know whose idea that was, but... Uh, John has been a gift to this conference and to me personally as a conference minister. Uh, he's been someone that I could call on and say, hey, I'm really struggling with this, or do you have any, any guidance and advice? On a yearly basis, there is a time when John calls on, calls on all the conference ministers, um, and we have a quarterly call just to check in. It's no more than 10 or 20 minutes or so just to say, how, how is the Indiana-Kentucky Conference? Uh, he spends time praying with us and, and, and letting us know of his support, and it's what a gift that has been. There have been times uh, when I've been so grateful that John has written a book about steeplejacking, because uh, if you don't know that term, that's when uh, non-UCC clergy um, will come into churches and take a church out of the denomination, and John has written a book about that, and we faced that a couple of times in our conference, and John was an enormous resource of trying to help us think about how we address uh, that dynamic. John is uh, coming up upon the final weeks, months, of his time of serving the wider church as our general minister and president. Um, I won't say what is ahead for John. Maybe John wants to say a little bit about that, maybe, but we are grateful for the many years that you have spent uh, serving this church, uh, sharing your gifts, um, calling us to action around, around white supremacy, as well as around Christian nationalism, and helping us to think about how the church might move forward into the future. John, uh, we want to welcome you to Indiana Kentucky Conference's 60th annual gathering, uh, and we're grateful you are here, and would you come and share with us this evening? Let me start by saying what a gift Chad is, not just to the Indiana Kentucky Conference, but to the United Church of Christ, respected and beloved by his peers in the, Col the Council of Conference Ministers. And one of the things that I've appreciated in the relationship that we've developed through your years as serving here is your depth of spiritual awareness and your willingness to help the body of Christ embrace a spiritual core and grounding. That's one of your gifts. Um, yep. So I wasn't great at math, but I can do a little math. 60 years is the Indiana Kentucky Conference and John Kruger and Earl Miller are celebrating their 60th anniversaries, so. You're as old as the conference, John. <laughs> or older, I guess. 
I'm going to uh, center my thoughts tonight in a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. The quote was actually shared with me by the interim conference minister of the Indiana Kentucky Conference, Phil Hart. Uh, Phil was serving here as your interim conference minister the last time I was here in person for an annual meeting. And he shared with me this quote from Nick, Thich Nhat Hanh. Sometimes my joy is the source of my smile. At other times, my smile is the source of my joy. I could stand here this evening after eight years of serving as the general minister and president and rehearse and recite for you all of the things that would steal our joy and our smile from us. But I have learned that even in the midst of despair, even through three years of the collective trauma that has been the enduring of this pandemic, if we choose to, we can focus on that which brings joy and hope, and it abounds. And so what I want to do tonight, channeling my inner Thich Nhat Hanh, is find the smile inside that will become the source of my joy. And, and bear witness to what eight years of serving as the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ has been like. I have discovered in this sort of season of closing out my ministry that my heart is filled with gratitude. In fact, back in late March, I started 100 Days of Gratitude as a way of closing out my ministry to thank you, not for anything that you've done to me, but to thank you for what has been eight years of bearing witness to who you are and the difference that being who you are makes in the world. And I, I was asked when they did an article about this 100 Days, how in the world did you come up with a hundred things to be grateful for? And my response was, this could have been 300 days of gratitude, and I would still need more. And so allowing my smile to be the source of my joy, inviting myself to focus on that which gives me hope, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes sharing with you, reflecting with you, what it has been like to represent you to the world as the United Church of Christ. Michael Kinnaman, when serving as the General Secretary for the National Council of Churches, was once asked by a young skeptic, why do we even still have denominations? Not an unfair question. And Michael, in his role as General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, who may have had yet some investment in these denominations that this young upstart was questioning, said brilliantly, denominations exist in order to perpetuate an aspect of the gospel that but for them would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. It is a way of saying, I would suggest, and I believe, that denominationalism is not an aberration to the intent of even a Christ who would pray that they may all be one, but is in fact a part of the unfolding wisdom of the Holy Spirit who entrusts to each of those denominations the perpetuation of an aspect of the gospel that but for them would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. And there is wisdom in that. And there is beauty in that. And what may have begun in 1909 in Edinburgh in the birthing of an ecumenical movement, what may have begun as a desire to bring us all together, has evolved into a desire to see value 
in the unique articulation of the gospel that each of us as a part of the body of Christ offers. Now, I'm not the general minister and president of the Protestant movement in the United States. I'm the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ, which means in response to Michael, and in faithful obedience to a Holy Spirit who called us into being in 1957, I and we together bear the responsibility of then answering the question, why then do we exist? Why then does the Holy Spirit continue to invest in the perpetuation of an institutional identity known as the United Church of Christ? And it is precisely because we preserve aspects of the gospel that but for us would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. And I have borne witness to your willingness to accept that call to mission and the difference that it makes. And I think there are two aspects of the gospel that none of us would argue are in fact core values of the gospel that we preach and, I would argue, are in fact in danger of diminishment or extinction but for the United Church of Christ, and, I would argue, once identifying those, that they matter enough that the Holy Spirit envisions a future in which you, the United Church of Christ, matter. And those two aspects are, and neither one of these are going to surprise you, the one is encapsulated in our motto, that they may all be one. There is among us not just a spirit of coming together to a table across theological divides, and this is who we are. And trust me, from, night, from 2016 forward, I have borne witness to what it means to be congregations filled with those with conservative ideologies and those with progressive ideologies. And while the country, and while families, and while communities may be tearing themselves apart because of that, the United Church of Christ continues to call that disparate, political, ideologically attuned group of people to the same table, and believes that that's possible for the body of Christ. That's part of our gift to the world and to the body of Christ. Evidence and proof and demonstration and bearing witness that the table is big enough to hold us all. It's a hard way to be the church, and I can bear witness to that too. But it's the right way to be the church. And our full-on commitment to living out that motto, and if there's one thing that if I could go back to 1957 and invite us to consider altering, would be that we don't call ourselves the United, as in past tense, Church of Christ, as in we did it, but the Uniting Church of Christ, because the work is always unfolding, not just in the world, but within the, the denomination itself. The hard work of living beyond our political and theological differences and knowing that the table is set for all. It's ongoing work. But that's an aspect of the gospel that but for the United Church of Christ and our now 63 united and uniting communions around the world with whom I got to gather in Karlsruhe, Germany last fall, that aspect of the gospel would be in danger of diminishment or extinction. But there's a second one. This too is not going to surprise you. It will be familiar to you. And that is, you can hear this almost every Sunday in almost every sanctuary across the land. I know because for eight years I've been traveling to almost every sanctuary across the land. And I hear it all the time. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. I do this presentation on the... What, is going, what are the characteristics of a future vital congregation? And one of them is that you have created safe space for everybody. It will be the case within the decade that if you're a congregation or a denomination or a conference or a region still deliberating or debating open and affirming, then the current generation of worshipers are going to see you as irrelevant, no matter how you come out the other side of that dialogue. 
If you haven't already resolved that, and trust me, that's not just a progressive denomination like the United Church of Christ speaking, that's not just progressive Christianity. The George Barna Institute, which has been studying dynamics in conservative, fundamentalist, evangelical Christianity for decades, has recognized that they're losing the entire generation over their unwillingness to bend over the role of women in the church and the role of the LGBT community in the church. And our unashamed, unapologetic commitment to no matter who you are or where you are, life's dirty, you're welcome here, trust me, is an aspect of the gospel that but for the United Church of Christ and maybe the Waldensians in Italy is in danger of diminishment or extinction. We can see entire denominations, ecumenical partners, currently tearing themselves apart over this. That doesn't mean that we're not without our own conflict over it, but we have declared ourselves in our identity and missional integrity to be that body, and that's our gift to the body of Christ. And that is why I said this eight years ago when I presented myself as a nominee to General Senate. That is why I believe the Holy Spirit envisions a future in which you matter. Because the Holy Spirit knows that the body of Christ will never be complete without a part of that body committed to that they may all be one and that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Um, people have mentioned to me today, kind of flippantly and jokingly, that you love your job. That's, they say that because on all my social media posts, I put, I love my job, right? It's been eight years of I love my job. It's where 100 days of gratitude are born out of. Here's why, and I'll tell a couple stories, here's why I say that over and over and over again. Because truly, for eight years, I have borne witness to what it looks like to see a people committed to that they may all be one and no matter who you are. And I'm talking about driving three hours up windy roads in the Andes Mountains through jungles and through United Nations encampments where inside are FARC rebels who have just signed a peace treaty to end a 52-year civil war with their country. A peace treaty organized by mission partners called out of the United Church of Christ. I mean, I'm talking about driving through an hour of jungle down a dirt road in Bangladesh and opening up into a village of women who took money from churches like yours that we collected and gave to them in order to form a co-op that changed their whole economic outlook. I'm talking about walking into a Syrian refugee camp a kilometer from the Syrian border in the Jordanian desert and listening to women talk about what a difference it made for the United Church of Christ to show up because they were getting products that no other religious organization would give women and that their lives would be horrible without. I'm talking about everywhere I go around this world and in this country, somebody pulling me aside and telling me there the United Church of Christ saved my life story. I never get tired of hearing them over and over and over again. I have had the gift, the honor, the pleasure of representing a United Church of Christ completely committed to those two aspects of the gospel. And it has been amazing. I spent 12 years in conference ministry, and I used to say about that work, I get to see by doing this the church at its best and at its worst. And I'm looking around the room at many who have served in conference ministry, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. For eight years as the general minister and president, it's been eight years of only seeing the church at its best. It's a bubble, I, I admit it. 
So when I get called in as the president to visit a church or a conference annual meeting, they're throwing a party. Everybody is on their best behavior. And the stories I hear are the stories they're telling me of something that they're proud of, of their church, of their conference, of their beloved conference minister and conference staff. And it's over and over and over again hearing what makes people happy and proud and joyful and hopeful about being a part of the church. And that's what this last eight years has been like. Nobody's calling me in to settle their conflict. And if I'm visiting a congregation, that's often a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for that church, and they put, again, their best foot forward. Carrie Georgia, this is going to be the best, I don't know, is it 8, 10, 12 years of your life? I don't know, but it is amazing. And let me tell you something. Watching the United Church of Christ at its best, there's nothing like it. I remember, and I'll, I'll finish with this, because I want to leave time for any questions or comments that you have. It was my first month, this would have been October of 2015, and the Pope was coming to visit the U.S. And there was an interfaith prayer event at the uh, American Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and I was invited to speak at that. The theme was on the encyclical that the Pope had just written um, on the environment and care for the earth. And so uh, I was invited to represent the United Church of Christ in that interfaith service talking about our commitments to eco-justice. I got there early and there were two individuals that I just, they were early too and I ran into them um, one was Sheldon Whitehouse, and if you've been following the ethics uh, watch party of the Supreme Court, Sheldon Whitehouse is leading that sort of investigative work. He's the senior senator from Rhode Island, and I had seen him a number of times on MSNBC, and I knew exactly who he was. And I saw him and I thought, what are the protocols here? Can you just walk up to a senator? And I was a little nervous about that, and I looked around, I didn't see any Secret Service, and he was just standing there, and I thought, I'm going to risk it. And I went over and shook his hand and introduced myself, and he said, I know who you are. And I went. <laughs> it turns out he's an active, faithful, happy member of a UCC church, and he couldn't wait to tell me about his pastor, he said, I just, I wish you could meet her. She's wonderful. I love her. And it was a short while later, I was sitting, and it just so happened that as we were sitting up on the, on the altar up there, that my seat was next to his, and then on the other side of me was the U.S. ambassador from South Africa. And I'm only a month on the job. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I, this is literally what happened. I'm singing a song in my head. Remember that old Sesame Street song, One of These Things Doesn't Belong Here? <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I'm thinking, I'm John Dorhauer. I'm the brother of Janice, Jeff, Jerry, Jim, Joe, and Jay. What am I doing here? I got Sheldon Whitehouse on this side, and the Ambassador from South Africa over here? And then it hit me. You're not John Dorhauer. You're the general minister and president of the United Church of Christ. One of the most powerful agents for social transformation this world has ever known. My God, we've got pastors from rural southern Indiana that help make peace agreements possible in Sri Lanka. When we show up, we make a difference. And that's what hit me that night. 
when they write the story of the United Church of Christ hundreds of years from now, nobody's going to be writing about our size. That won't impress anybody. But nobody will doubt our impact. And when I think about the hope that we have, it's born in a body of people radically committed to the proclamation of a gospel that believes that everybody's welcome at this table no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, no matter who you voted for, no matter what political party you represent, no matter what your gender identity is or your sexual orientation is or your age is. Here, you belong because Christ sets the table for all. And when for eight years you get to travel around the world and see the difference that that makes in people's lives, you'd ask for 100 days of gratitude too. So thank you for the honor of serving on your behalf. And thank you for the ways that you show up every day in your communities and change lives. Thank you. We've got time before ice cream. If there are questions or comments or articulations, there's already a hand over here. I just want to personally thank you for eight years. <laughs> thank you for your service. I You're think welcome. you've been a great representative for our denomination. Uh, that's very kind. Thank you. shedding a lot of tears these, years, these days. We, John. Am I, is, oh, <laughs> Look around. I know. Sorry. So this is kind of a time for exit interviews, right? Okay. So you're, is this a tour of the conferences giving exit interviews? So you should also be at a time when you feel freer to speak truth. And, and so as we venture on into the future, remaining in the United Church of Christ, uh, what challenges specifically, uh, if you could you know, uh, highlight one that you, uh, we need to be mindful of? Let me highlight two, if you don't mind. The first challenge was actually given to us in 2015 by Paul Rauschenbusch. At the time, religion editor for Huffington Post magazine, who keynoted at the uh, General Synod in Cleveland in 2015, and spoke about the unfolding digital revolution that was coming. And first saying, you may not like it, but you can't avoid it. Quit fighting it. And then saying, not unlike I've been trying to say here, you're the United, you're the United Church of Christ. Now, Paul is not a member of the United Church of Christ. He was uh, representing progressive Christianity at large, but he was very clear about his message to us. Do not sit on the sidelines for the digital revolution. If the church doesn't evolve and become a part of that, they will be on the sidelines. And what he was saying is that the church and the world cannot afford to have the United Church of Christ sit on the sidelines. Now, I watched for the last two decades uh, the institutional church, not just the UCC, but certainly we were a part of that, either fight that revolution or believe that they didn't need to be a part of it, that they were going to be okay without that. That's why I entitled my second book, Beyond Resistance, because if we don't get beyond the resistance to that, we will be irrelevant, and that was Paul's message to us. And then in March of 2020, we all kind of said, we have no choice. So here's the first challenge. Embrace what you learned over the last three years. There is nothing wrong with what we do here in gathering. And this will continue to produce life within the body of Christ. But there's a whole world out there that we're only going to reach by entering the digital revolution and entering it well. 
That's the first challenge. The second, I have been in contact with or visiting in person with individuals whose numbers now are growing, who are being targeted, and I mean specifically targeted, with death threats and hate mail, churches being firebombed, individual pastors with Proud Boys night after night after night outside their home on megaphones, daring them to come out or their neighbors to come out and protect them. Students in Southern Florida who are being displaced from their campus by a governor who has aspirations for the White House. This is not so much take note of that because you all know about that. But what I'm hearing from all of them is they doubt the commitments of the white privileged cisgendered community when things get as tough as they are now? Are you going to be there when the fire bombs and the death threats and the proud boys with their mega horns show up? And I've listened to even some of the most dedicated churches deliberate about whether or not in the presence of that, it's time for them to tone it down. And what I'm hearing from those who, because of their chosen life journey, have no choice but to continue to show up is, who's going to still be there when the going gets tough? And that's the second challenge, show up. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, when God calls you, God bids you come and die, which is his way of saying, even when it gets tough and the price for showing up is high, you show up. So that would be the second challenge. And make no mistake, it's going to get tougher out there than it is right now. There's no doubt about that. So I have a, a clergy friend. Um, we've been having an ongoing conversation about the challenge of Purple Church. Yeah. And I heard you kind of speaking to that. and. Um, so my question is, how in this increasingly polarized culture, um, how do churches stand up boldly for social justice when we can't even seem to agree on a common truth about what mm. injustice looks yeah. like? How do you see that happening? It's a very, very good question, and, and I would offer a couple of responses. There's no single response that's going to make sense in every context or every setting. One of the most important things that you can do in your community is articulate your identity and your mission, and hold to that uncompromisingly, and make sure that there's a good, solid theological basis for both your identity and your mission. And once you know what that is, you have to be willing to say goodbye to members who can't embrace that identity or that mission. And if you're not, that's not your identity. If you're willing to compromise it in order to keep somebody, you're somebody other than you're telling yourself you are, if that makes sense. And then the second thing I would say to that, and, and that's relevant for churches who are going through the conversation about whether or not to call themselves open and affirming. When I was with on conference staff and consulting with churches like that, I would tell them early on, when you get to the point where somebody says they're going to leave if you do this, and you're willing to stop doing it because of that, you're not open and affirming, right? It, uh, the second thing is, the questions about we can argue about truth and we can argue about what's justice, if we're not taking the responses from those who have been forced into the margins because of the unjust circumstances they're living through, then we really don't know the answer to that question. If you're not living in the margins, it's really not your responsibility to answer the question, what is justice? And I'm going to quote, um, this was a young pastor who was attending an annual meeting, he was openly gay, and the moderator of his church was a trans woman and they were the two representing their church, and they just heard a sermon 
about finding the peaceful middle ground about zealots on the one side and Pharisees on the other side and how we need to find the peaceful middle ground and reconcile with. And he stood up and said to the preacher afterwards, I want to know how much of my justice you're willing to compromise in order to reconcile with my abusers. Now, justice looked like one thing from the pulpit of the preacher who was asking for the zealots to get less angry and the Pharisees to get less judicial and find the peaceful middle ground. But from the perspective of that pastor in that church, the question was, how much of my justice are you willing to sacrifice in order to reconcile with my abusers? So this question around justice really has to be answered from within the margins. And as I said a moment ago, if we're committed to justice, we don't just show up until it stops feeling good or we've assuaged our guilt about our contribution to the injustice. We keep showing up until those who are forced into the margin say, all right, we've got what we need. Does that make sense? Thank you. What an important question. And we could actually spend three days rehearsing that. That was a very quick answer to a very complex reality. Dakota. Thanks, John. I have a question. There's a lot of um, clergy in this room who we um, maybe just celebrated that went through much of their careers not necessarily worrying about losing their jobs. But there's a lot of clergy in this room in this particular corner who are quite literally could lose their job if they preach the gospel that the United Church of Christ preaches. So my question is, how do you think the UCC should change its polity to protect its pastors from hateful and terrible congregations? So there are a number of ways to answer that. Uh, let's just resolve that in the couple of minutes that I'm gonna give in response to that. You're not gonna get all of the answers that you want. But I'm going to answer the literal first part of the question, how? Given our polity, it won't be something that, um, we don't have a top and a bottom, but it won't be something that the wider church settles for the body. It has to come up organically out of the roots, whether that's through a general synod action or pronouncement. Um, and there are, there are mechanisms to do what you're talking about. If our salaries, as they do in the Methodist Church, come from the, the wider church in the region and everybody gets paid the same amount no matter what, we could pay everybody regardless of what happens. And the Methodist Church guarantees, guarantees every ordained pastor a salary no matter what. We could create a system like that. That's one pathway to do that. Um, I would need a little more time to think mechanically and logistically through responses like that. Um, but there are ways to do that. Um, I'm going to say one more thing, Dakota. I served, a, my first church was, they self-identified as conservative. Their hearts were far more along that liberal edge than they had been acculturated to think about themselves. And I knew that if I went in and just started forcing things like open and affirming and racial justice and uh, all of that on them, it would break them. Or it would mean my immediate exit from the congregation. And I remember spending an evening with William Sloan Coffin. I mean, I hero worship this guy. And after spending a few nights with him and listening to tell him stories about his prophetic bona fides, I mustered the courage, like on night three, to tell a story about my prophetic bona fides. After which, he said while sitting in his bed, sipping a glass of vodka, he said, John, true, but not helpful. <laughs> what he was saying is that if you're serving in a local church, it's not about establishing your prophetic bona fides, it's about playing the long game. And I preached eight years in that church, but they never became open and affirming. And 20 years after I left, when the youth that I had been working with got into positions of authority and on the council, two years ago, they voted to become an open and affirming church. That's an indirect way of responding to your question. But your responsibility as the local church pastor 
isn't about am I preaching the truth in ways that establish my bona fides, Am I playing the long game and preaching in a way that softens and opens up hearts? It's what Chip Dan did for 30, no, 40 some odd years in Southern Indiana. It's playing the long game. And if I could tell one more story about William Coffin, and I won't use the language he used. He's a little more comfortable with it than I am in open public. But he was once asked, how do you keep your job saying the things you do from the pulpit? And he said, I keep my job because I'm an effing good pastor. Which his, was his way of saying, first you love and you build trust. And once they know that they can trust you and they know that you love them, then you can begin to preach in ways that open up their hearts and they're not just going to, it softens and that's playing the long game. Uh, again, this. The question you ask requires so much more in response, but those are just a few things to say. Chad, what time is it? I don't want to overextend you. You doing a time check? Okay. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you from ice cream. So, I don't want to so keep John, you from the, ice cream. First, I want to thank thank you for showing up today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for showing up for the last eight years as general minister. Thank you for showing up. You're welcome. Karen Georgia Thompson, thank you for showing up here in Indianapolis. Thank you for being here tonight. My question, John, is what would you ask of us mm -hmm. to help ensure what we hope will be the successful nomination of Karen Georgia Thompson as our next general minister and to make it a thriving ministry for all of us? What a great question. Here's the thing. The United Church of Christ is a culture that breeds a, a, um, a way of being in ministry together, and I'm talking about lay and clergy alike, that confronts power, right? This is a part of who we are. This whole just world for all peace is about us taking on the kind of power that abuses its authority and belittles and marginalizes and oppresses people. We can easily take the leadership that we cultivate to do that and direct it at ourselves. And even though we don't have a hierarchy, if you serve as an association leader, as a conference leader, or as a national leader, there is a sense in which you become the power that needs to be reined in or checked. And it's something that I've experienced certainly in the 12 years that I served in conference ministry. I don't want to exaggerate this and say it makes it difficult to do something. But I have been repeating over and over and over again, the day that we start to pull together in commitment to this shared ministry and stop fighting each other, is the day that we really discover what the Holy Spirit has in store for us. And it's not unusual for me as I travel around um, to hear, and I don't want to, there are things for which you should complain, about which you should complain. There are things for which we need to be held accountable. Don't, don't hear me saying I, I'm not asking for that. But there are things that I hear that are said because you don't understand the full context of what had to go into making a decision that was made. And the amount of time and energy that we as national and sometimes conference leaders have to spend defending or explaining, sometimes not even being able to give the full amount of information that we, we hold, it, it sucks energy out of us and out of the room. So if I could say one thing, the first thing would be this. This is an incredibly gifted leader. She's smart, she's strong, she She's courageous. She has decades of being in ministry in the margins and on the trenches around the world. And what she brings to this is unlike any other of her predecessors. And so trust that if she has represented a decision, it's been fully vetted and it's a good decision for the body. If you have questions, ask them, but don't enter the conversation with a presumption that she did something she shouldn't have. 
she's better than that, and she cares enough about this denomination that she would never do anything that would bring potential harm on it. And she has vetted and considered all possibilities. And more often than not, she's representing a decision that many people made that you, so it would be unusual that she would. So that would be the first thing. And the second thing is, as I said a moment ago, own your identity and own your mission and build a network of relationships with covenant partners in this room who are as committed to that as you are. If there's one thing about the United Church of Christ writ large that presents a risk and a challenge to our full thriving, it's our clinging to a sense of autonomy that within the culture of America can come across looking a lot like fierce and radical independence. We are a fully interdependent body. And covenant is the modality by which we call ourselves into being. Autonomy is an aspect of a core value that we hold in order to keep powers from outside the congregation defining its theology or defining its liturgy or defining the way that they govern themselves. But covenant is the way that we organize ourselves. And so being clear about your collective identity and mission and embracing and cultivating the covenant partnerships in that work of identity and mission is absolutely critical and essential. Does that make sense? You're welcome. It's the two-week ordained pastor, Ken Rhodes. Love it. John, this is probably the most difficult question of all this evening. Yeah. What is your favorite ice cream? Ooh. It's either mint chip or pralines and cream. Baskin Robbins, pralines and cream. Friends, let's go have some ice cream and enjoy.